Are you feeling the sting of sky-high prices on PC gaming gear lately? Fear not. Despite the inflation storming through the market, you can still craft a killer budget rig for the cost of what was once a mid-tier setup. What's more, the components available today pack a serious punch compared to their predecessors. With the right patience and know-how, you'll uncover hidden gems and jaw-dropping deals on top-notch hardware. Are you ready to dive into the ultimate gaming bargain hunt? Before we get into this video, I'd like to say not to forget to hit the like button and subscribe. Additionally, don't forget to leave a comment, especially if there's something I missed. I can't cover every aspect of an entire computer in the relatively short duration of a video. I more so wanted to start off by discussing some of the pricing of parts I went with, along with the logic I went with when selecting them. Without anything else that needs to be said, let's dive into the $500 PC build. It's significantly better than what I was expecting to be able to get. Starting off with what everybody probably wants to know. The graphics card I went with is the Intel Arc A750. Partly because I had one on hand, but also because you can easily find one of these cards for at or below the $200 mark in the US. Cards that can be found at this price are all older 1080 Ti's and RX 5700 XT's. And if you're wanting to put together a similar build, then they would be an excellent substitute for the A750. What the A750 has over the 1080 Ti on 5700 XT though is more up-to-date DirectX 12 Ultimate support, guaranteeing the ability for the Intel card to run ray tracing, variable ray shading, and XMX accelerated ZSS, which I feel will all become more helpful when trying to achieve more performance on this hardware as the console generation progresses. I paid $200 for this used A750 a while ago, so that's what I'll be putting down as the GPU cost, but at the same time you'll be able to get similar performance with a slightly cheaper 5700 XT. For the brains of the build, I kind of cheaped out, but it's because I found the chip for such a decent price. The i3-12100, which was supposed to be a 12100F when I ordered it, was a nice little surprise find for $78 with free shipping. This Golden Cove-based quad-core hyper-threaded chip has very high single-threaded throughput, but may start to fall behind when it comes to games that require many cores. With 12 megabytes of shared level 3 cache, the chip has the circuitry to feed the core's data along with processing said information quickly. To cool the chip, I initially used a 240mm AIO I had on hand just to get the system up and running, but you could use a sub-$20 tower cooler from Amazon as it could get the job done as well. Considering we're using a locked chip, that's all you really need to keep it from throttling, especially since it's got a 60 watt TDP, but usually hangs out around 45 watts when under load. For memory, we're using a 16 GB kit of Timetech DDR4 clocked to 3200 mega transfers per second that I got for $34. This is plenty of memory for a budget system, and will allow for the CPU to load in plenty of assets from the small but adequate Samsung 970 EVO 500 gig. I got this particular drive on sale at a Best Buy a few months ago for $40, and that's probably because it's a slightly older and slower PCIe Gen 3 based NVMe drive. I've had a couple of these over the past three years, and I've never had any of them fail in any way despite my somewhat negligent use of them. The drive is enough to store the OS in a few games at a time, which is fine for my use case, but you could potentially swap it out for a larger and or faster drive if you've got the extra money to spend. For this particular build, it'll be fine, as I'm not going to be using it as my main system, but this is probably one of the first things I would upgrade if given the chance. A worthwhile upgrade over a drive like this might be a Timetech NVMe drive like the one I've got here. It's only $75 and comes with 1TB of space, high read and write performance, and a large heatsink, making it pretty easy to justify in the value department. Now the motherboard I actually got on sale from Micro Center for $101 a little over two months ago. It's an MSI Mag B760 Tomahawk Wi-Fi DDR4, and it's got three NVMe slots and built-in Wi-Fi, so it's honestly a killer budget board. Granted I got it open box, and the reason why it was so cheap was because quote, the Wi-Fi doesn't work? Well it's been working fine after installing the Intel Wi-Fi drivers, so yeah. The board also supports memory overclocking, which I won't be doing, but it is an option if you're looking to squeeze a few more percent from your system. I got lucky with this board, but if you're going to be running a lower wattage Core i3 like I am in this build, you could pretty easily get away with an H610 board. I'm just using what's available in my region. 
Powering the entire PC is a 500 watt power spec PSU I also picked up at Micro Center for $40 at the same time I picked up the motherboard. Would I trust this thing to power a 14900K? Probably not. But for the sub 300 watts this hardware combo will draw, it's not going to cause any issues or be a fire hazard. It's a pretty limited supply in general, given it only has a single pigtail PCIe power connector cable, but for the A750 it'll be fine. And I haven't run into any overcurrent protection trips or power throttling on the components. Overall I spent just under $500 to get this build put together. With hindsight I'd probably pick up a larger NVMe SSD, but for testing this will be perfectly adequate. The specs of the build will be in the description as well if you wanted to replicate the tests being performed in this video. To see how the hardware performs, let's throw it to the wolves by booting up Cyberpunk 2077. Mostly because you guys voted for it, but also because I was testing it anyways because of its PC curb stomping rendering algorithms. Without any further ado, let's dive into Cyberbug, and see how this budget PC holds up. Starting off at the lowest possible settings. And the build overall achieved very playable performance at all resolutions, even though I probably wouldn't play through the game at 4K. Hitting an average and 1% low of 156 FPS at 1080p, performance dipped down to 88 FPS on average at 1440p, but actually came up on the 1% lows to 62. 4K achieved an average and 1% low of 57 and 37 FPS, which is still playable but isn't as enjoyable as lower resolutions. It might be worth enabling ZSS at 4K, which is what we'll be exploring next. Turning ZSS 1.2 onto the quality mode, and the game overall didn't see much of an improvement, probably because we're CPU bottlenecked. With an average at 1% low of 98 and 58 FPS at 1080p, ZSS didn't help that much with the 1% lows and maximums, but actually made the average slightly worse. This is all within margin of error, so in reality performance didn't change that much when enabling ZSS at 1080p. 1440p was a similar story to 1080p, with the average and 1% lows coming down to 79 and 51 FPS respectively. This is probably because of a random in-game event that increased GPU usage, such as a car exploding or a shootout occurring, and for the most part I'd say is probably within margin of error thanks to the aforementioned CPU bottleneck. 4K though saw a bit of an improvement at all measured data points, with the average and 1% lows coming in at 66 and 44 FPS respectively. Probably not the smoothest performance, but it's definitely playable now, whereas it was right on the cusp beforehand. Turning the settings up to the medium preset and maintaining ZSS 1.2 on the quality setting saw slight performance degradations at all resolutions, but not a significant falloff like I was expecting. 4K saw the largest hit to performance, with the average dipping down to 55 FPS and the 1% low to 43. So while it remains playable for the most part, I'd probably stick to the lowest settings if you're hellbent on playing at 4K on this hardware combo. Just for giggles and grins, I set the graphics preset to the RT low setting, which enabled some local light shadowing but kept ray trace reflections and global illumination calculations off the table. ZSS is still on the quality mode here, and at 1080p the 73fps average and 40fps 1% low is beyond playable if you're coming from something like a PlayStation 5 or Xbox Series X, but it's an enormous upgrade over the last gen Xbox One and PS4 versions. Even at 1440p, the average and 1% low came in at 55 and 33fps respectively, once again remaining playable, but I'd probably stick to 1080p or turn ZSS down another notch to keep performance from dipping down in some scenes. At the Ultra preset, with ray tracing turned off and ZSS set to the performance mode, 1080 and 1440p saw similar performance, with the averages coming in at 76 and 75 FPS respectively, but they deviated from each other when it came to the 1% lows. 1440p saw a somewhat strong showing with a 52 FPS 1% low, while 1080p returned a 1% low of 39 FPS, hinting at a CPU bottleneck experienced at both resolutions but exacerbated by turning things down to 1080p. 4K returned an average and 1% low of 49 and 41 FPS respectively, which is still relatively playable but may not be optimal, leaving me wanting to either turn down the settings or resolution to claw back some frames. In terms of the settings that we can adjust to make the game perform a little better, the crowd density selector seems to make the most difference on this particular system since we're CPU limited. 
This would make the most sense, as AI pathing and behavior trees are primarily stored and calculated on the CPU. But what makes me hesitant to touch this setting is the overall lifelessness of the world. At the highest setting, the amount of NPCs on the screen makes the world feel lived in and like there are others actively living in the world that you're prowling. Turning the setting down to the lowest preset, and pedestrian and vehicular traffic become so sparse that you rarely see any other characters besides police when you decide to go cyber psycho mode. Where in other open world games like GTA V and Red Dead Redemption 2, you can get away with this because their maps are less dense, so it makes sense that NPCs and other interactable characters are more spaced out. But in a game that's supposed to be a sprawling metropolis, a lot of the fun of this game is lost when you decide to reduce the simulation quality of the world. Graphically speaking, this game looks decent, even at the lowest settings. But where it falls behind in performance is the effect that NPCs have on performance, and the resulting amount of things going on that are visible to the player. At lower simulation quality settings, things run fine for the most part, shown by just playing through the game with a frame rate counter on. It's just missing some of the sprawl that's present on the higher simulation settings, which the system can 100% run but can kind of chug at times. An i5-12400 would probably be a slightly better choice if you're wanting to build a system to target this game, but even my significantly more expensive i5-13600K has trouble keeping up with the higher NPC counts. Once the settings get turned up, then the GPU becomes more of the bottleneck, but that doesn't happen until we get to the high preset. Generally, the medium preset looks good enough, as it has all the graphical bells and whistles, but they're just rendered at a lower fidelity. It runs good enough as well, and is generally playable without upscaling at 1080 and 1440p. No matter what the settings are at 4K, you probably want to rock with some form of upscaling to gain some performance. ZSS really is a savior for this build and this particular piece of software when it comes to the average and maximum performance, but it doesn't help as much in the 1% lows. I'd be curious to see if other titles using ZSS or even FSR see similar gains at the lower end of the performance spectrum, but that's a question best answered in another video. I think this game highlights a weakness in this particular system and that the CPU is significantly weaker than the graphics card, but at the same time Cyberpunk is notorious for bringing any and all hardware to its knees. Other titles such as GTA V, Red Dead Redemption 2, or the Fallout games provide performance that's not as CPU limited, but it's still definitely an issue there as well if you push things hard enough. Keep an eye out for some of the parts in this build. The value offered by them in combination is hard to beat for the price. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Let me know what you guys think about this budget build. Which parts would you keep, and which parts would you maybe change out and why? I'm curious as to what you think is the best value for your particular use case, as it'll be different for everyone. That's all I really have to say on the matter. So thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.